This is Film Bookcast. Film Bookcast. Film Bookcast. The official podcast of Film Book. Get ready for the latest in film news, TV show news, and theatrical reviews. Film Book's podcast starts now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Film Bookcast, the official podcast of Film Book. My name is Chris Banks. If you're tuning into Film Bookcast for the first time, first of all, welcome. And what I do on this podcast is discuss the latest film and TV show news. I also review an in theater film. You can find more about Film Bookcast on film book.com by using the search term Film Bookcast. You can also email us at podcast at film book.com with Film Bookcast in the subject line. Let's jump right into movie news this week. In more film news, if you're planning on going to see Venom or Fast 9, their premiere dates have changed. Venom Let There Be Carnage will now go on September 17th instead of June 25th. This comes in the wake of Universal moving F9, Fast and Furious 9, from its summer release date originally to now Memorial Day weekend. The Venom sequel will have the full suite of 3D IMAX and premium large fat format screens. Previously, Sony had The Man from Toronto on September 17th, but that film has been moved to a to-be-determined date for the time being. Also opening on September 17th is another sequel, The Boss Baby Family Business. With theaters having been closed for the biggest part of the last year, Big markets like Los Angeles and New York are beginning to reopen in stages. L.A. venues saw their first butts in the seats this week as they were allowed to reopen at just 25% capacity, or 100 people, whichever was less. Further off is a reopening of the European circuits. The original Venom film, released in the first weekend of October in 2018, charted an October record of $80.2 million, but it was outdid by Joker, who did 96.2. Tom Hardy is reprising his role as the spider anti-hero. And Michelle Williams is back as well, in addition to Woody Harrelson as the villain Carnage. In more film news, Netflix has picked up the worldwide rights to He's All That, a gender-swapped remake of the beloved 90s classic She's All That. He's All That stars TikTok star Addison Rae in her acting debut as Paget Sawyer in a role inspired by Freddie Prinze Jr.'s Zack Seiler. Rachel Lee Cook, who played lovable art geek Lainey Boggs in the 1999 original, will play Plagdit Sawyer's wise and caring mother. Pagdit accepted a challenge to turn the school's least popular boy, played by Cobra Kai's Tanner Buchanan, into, into a prom king, attempting to avenge himself following a humiliating fallout with her boyfriend. The remake also stars Madison Peters, Peyton Mayer, Isabella Crovetti, Annie Jacob, and Myra Molloy. Mark Waters, di- who also directed Mean Girls and Freaky Friday, will be directing the picture, and R. Lee Fleming, who wrote the original screenplay for the film, is writing a fresh spin of Pegde- from Pegdet's perspective. The original She's All That producers will return as He's All That producers. Netflix will release the film later this year. This week, we saw the 93rd Academy Award nomination list. And for Best Picture, The Father, Judas and the Black Messiah, Mank, Minari, Nomadland, and Promising Young Woman, Sound of Metal, and The Trial of the Chicago 7. For Best Director, Lee Isaac Chung for Minari, Emerald Fennel for Promising Young Woman, David Fincher for Mank, Chloe Zhao for Nomadland, and Thomas Vinterberg for Another Round. Best Actor, Riz Ahmed, Sound of Metal, Chadwick Boseman, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Anthony Hopkins, The Father, Gary Oldman, Mank, Stephen Yoon, Minari, Best Actress, Viola Davis, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Andra Day, The United States vs. Billie Holiday, Vanessa Kirby, Pieces of a Woman, Frances McDormand, Nomadland, Carrie Mulligan, Promising Young Woman, Best Supporting Actor, Sasha Baron Cohen, The Trial of the Chicago 7, Daniel Kaluuya, Judas and the Black Messiah, Leslie Odom Jr., One Night in Miami, Paul Racy, Sound of Metal, Lakeith Stanfield, Judas and the Black Messiah, Best Supporting Actress, Maria Bakalova, Borat Subsequent Movie Film, Glenn Close, Hillbilly Elegy, Olivia Coleman, The Father, Amanda Seyfried, Mank, Yu Jung Yun, Minari, Original Screenplay, Judas and the Black Messiah, Minari, Promising Young Woman, 
Sound of Metal, and The Trial of the Chicago 7. Best Adapted Screenplay, Borat's Subsequent Movie Film, The Father, Nomadland, One Night in Miami, and The White Tiger. Best Animated Feature, Onward, Over the Moon, A Shaun the Sheep Movie, Farmageddon, Soul, and Wolf Walkers. Best Production Design, Father, Mank, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, News of the World, and Tenant. Best Costume Design, Emma, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Mank, Mulan, and Pinocchio. Best Cinematography, Sean Bobit for Judas and the Black Messiah, Eric Messerschmidt, Mank, Darius Wolski, News of the World, Joshua James Richards, Nomadland, Fedden Papa Michael, The Trial of the Chicago 7, for Editing, The Father, Nomadland, Promising Young Woman, Sound of Metal, and The Trial of the Chicago 7. Best Makeup and Hairstyling, Emma Hillbilly Elegy, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Mank, and Pinocchio. Best Sound, Greyhound, Mank, News of the World, Soul, and Sound of Metal. For Visual Effects, Love and Monsters, The Midnight Sky, Mulan, The One and Only Ivan, and Tenant. Score, To Five Bloods, Mank, Minari, News of the World, and Soul. Best Documentary Feature, Collective, Crip Camp, The Mole Agent, My Octopus Teacher, and Time. Best International Feature, Another Round, Denmark, Better Days, Hong Kong. Collective, Romania, The Man Who Sold His Skin, Tunisia, and K. Vadis Aida, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Best Animated Short, Burrow, Genius Loki, If Anything Happens, I Love You, Opera, Yes People. Best Documentary Short, Colette, A Concerto is a Conversation, Do Not Split, Hunger Ward, A Love Song for Latasha, and Best Live Action Short, Feeling Through, The Letter Room, The Present, Two Distant Strangers, and White Eye. Let's head on over to TV trailers. In TV trailers, Amazon Prime Video's 2021 horror anthology TV series titled Them, starring Deborah Oyorendi, Ashley Torres, among many others. Lena Wath created Them. The Amoris moved to Compton, but Palmer Drive isn't what it seems. Them is a limited anthology series that explores terror in America. The first season, 1950s set Covenant centers around a black family who moved to North Carolina to an all-white Los Angeles neighborhood during a period known as the Great Migration. The family's idyllic home becomes ground zero where malevolent forces, next door and otherworldly, threaten to taunt, ravage, and destroy them. Watch the Them trailer. It debuts on Amazon Prime Video April 9th. Sam and Bucky embark on a global adventure in Disney Plus's 2021 TV miniseries. The third and final TV trailer of The Winter of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier has been released. It stars Anthony Mackie and Sebastian Stan. It centers around a new world without Captain America. His closest friends, Sam and Bucky, will have to step in and step up to bring hope to the people. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier will begin airing on Disney Plus March 19th. Let's jump right into some TV news. In TV news, Natalie Portman signs a first-look TV deal with Apple. The deal with Portman and her producing partner Sophie Mass follows series order for the pair's Lady in the Lake. Apple has signed the First Look TV deal with Natalie Portman and her producing partner Sophie Mass under the newly launched production company Mountain A. The new deal follows the series order earlier this month for Apple TV's Lady in the Lake, which Portman will executive produce and star alongside Lupita Nyong'o. Lady in the Lake is a limited series from Honey Boy director Alama Harl and writer Dre Ryan. It's an adaptation of a 2019 novel of the same name by Laura Lipman. The project centers on an investigative journalist and a black progressive activist in the 1960s Baltimore. This marks Portman's fourth foray into television. Wednesday's deal with Apple also marks the first production deal for per Portman and Mass. Apple has partnered with many high-profile parties, including Oprah Winfrey, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, Kerry Aaron, Leonardo DiCaprio, Ridley Scott, Scott Free Productions, A24, and Imagine Documentaries. Very exciting TV news. In more TV news, Ridley Scott and Stephen Knight plot a 10-episode World War II epic titled Roads to Freedom. The 10-episode epic that will tell the story of World War II from several international perspectives is based on the Sir Anthony Bevers books. 
The intention is to tell a story using fresh and unique perspectives. While most Hollywood war films have focused on the American and British effort, Roads to Freedom will portray the, the brutal realities from multiple viewpoints with characters not only from the US and UK, but also from Russia, Germany, and France, and other countries across the globe. That includes women and children struggling to survive. The, eff the emphasis is on humanity. The characters are bound together by one dramatic story. Some of the storylines will be dis discomforting, but heroic and the race between the East and the West to capture Berlin will shed light on what became the foundations of the Cold War. Ridley Scott plans to direct the launch episode of the series, and Knight and Bever will write all the episodes. The book sold more than 8 million copies and is in 33 languages across the globe. Very exciting TV news from Ridley Scott's production company. Time for some movie trailers. In more movie trailers, Von Stein's Every Breath You Take trailer has been released by Vertical Entertainment. The Every Breath You Take stars Casey Affleck, Sam Clarifin, Michelle Monaghan, among many others. David Murray wrote the screenplay for Every Breath You Take. It's about a psychiatrist whose client commits suicide and finds his family disrupted after, after introducing her surviving brother to his wife and daughter. The Manchester by the Sea Oscar winner plays the mild-mannered psychiatrist who is unable to prevent his teenage client from committing suicide. Suicide. The deceased girl's older brother, played here by Sam Cleflin, is enormously upset. Though he secretly blames her psychiatrist for her death, he worms his way into the doctor's family life, developing personal relationships with the doctor's wife and teenage daughters. He soon reveals himself as someone they should fear and not welcome into their home. Watch the Every Breath You Take trailer. It debuts in theaters April 2nd. Let's get on over to this week's movie review. What do you think? For this week's movie review, we're going to talk about No Man Land. It's in theaters. It's also on Hulu. It just came out. It's directed by Chloe Zhao. It's written by Jessica Bruder. Based on a book by Jessica Bruder, it was, the screenplay was written by Chloe Zhao. It stars Frances McDormand, David Stratham, Linda May, among many others. It's one of the most popular movies right now. It's listed as number 10 on IMDb. Nomadland is about a woman, after losing everything in the Great Recession, she embarks on a journey through the American West, living as a car-dwelling modern nomad. It's an extremely touching film, and it's, it's actually a really real movie. It touches on extremely real topics, and Frances McDormand is so amazing, but she's so perfectly cast as... Fern, who obviously has lost everything post Great Recession, and we see that she loses her house and she's now living in her van. You know, it's actually a really real scenario for a lot of Americans, I think, and her age group. She's in her 60s, and most of the people who are living this kind of lifestyle are also in their 60s and older with health issues. And what does it mean when you get to this stage in life and essentially have your life stripped away from you? Have a bank take your house, lose your job, lose your family, lose your way of living life. What happens when you get to your 60s and this happens, right? Especially in America, what does, what, what does that mean? For Fern, it means that it pushes her into this nomad lifestyle and she's now living in her van. And she now lives in a community with people who do the same thing. They all live in their van. It's a beautiful but brutal way of showing the harsh reality of America right now. It's heartbreaking, but the way that these people come together is very beautiful. They form a very strong community. And Fern has many jobs. You see her throughout the film work many different jobs. I'm guessing it's temporary work, which is, again, just a real undertone about what living in America is right now, especially for retirees or soon-to-be retirees or people who should be retired, but they can't because of the financial reality of what living in a house costs or just living costs in America today. Housing and real estate, like these are the fault lines. This is where we see what has happened over the past 20 years, right? We see, take one market, the real estate market, and it shows you where capitalism has gone wrong in the past 20 years because you have people like Fern and a whole community of people who instead of living comfortably in a house with a retirement are living in a van in the middle of nowhere with no hope. They don't trust the system. They don't love their country because their country has put them in this place 
place, right? And you, you empathize with Fern very quickly and you see just how beautiful of a person she is, how welcoming she is. She's a hard worker. She doesn't make any excuses. She doesn't even feel bad for herself. She just is trying to get herself into a place where she is at peace and happy um, because she lost her husband as well. So she's dealing with all of this real life stuff and it's a really real spoonful for us as a viewer because it's it's honestly the economic reality of many, many older Americans. You see the deep distrust in this community towards quote-unquote the system or quote-unquote America because they're very disenchanted and disillusioned by having to live in their van. I can relate. I could... I would feel the exact same way if I spent 45 years working 40 hours a week and then I got to that place in life and I have nothing to show for it. It's disgusting. It's capital post Citizens United. Capitalism has just gone completely off the rails and housing is the border of that. It shows us what has happened, right? I mean, people are working four jobs to pay rent. You know, that's not, that's capitalism without regulations. And that's where, that's the America that we live in. Fern and the people of her community, nomad land, let's call it, have just rejected all of it. They've turned away from all of it and they're creating their own community, their own way of life almost. There's a scene where Fern is, they're trying to compare Fern's lifestyle to the original pioneers of America, and it's very similar because these people, Fern, are rejecting a king almost. They're rejecting a system, an oppressive system, which is very much like the original American pioneers did. We have to have that conversation as a people because we can't have people living in their vans. There's so much loss in the movie, you know, and what it does to us as people. You know, wh where do we go after loss? How do we find connection again? Love. You know, that's where the film kind of ends. You know, Fern is still searching for this love and this belonging. And to the outsider, this nomad lifestyle is giving up on life. But to f the beauty of it, the beauty of the film is it shows you how to Fern and to everyone else in the community and to, and to her sister, because her sister is very understanding of her lifestyle, that these people are living a very truthful life and they're trying to live their life to the fullest because they've gotten pushed into the ground by the system, by capitalism without regulations and so to the outsider to there's a scene where fern goes over her sister's house and she's having dinner with her sister's friends who obviously have real jobs but fern can't relate to those people because those people to fern are who put her out in the cold and those people, the people within the capitalist system, can't empathize to see the need for regulation because of their greed, right? Their greed is clouding their perception of Fern's life being destroyed because of no regulations. And instead, they kind of talk down to Fern. Fern reminds them that she's actually living her life the way she wants to, which is a good lesson for us as a viewer coming away from this movie is to see that this community of people are actually extremely loving, productive, heartwarming, good, trustful people. They have just been put out in the cold by a country who has, post Citizens United, completely focused on capitalists at the expense of consumers. If anything, Nomadland gives us a real-world taste about what that feels like and looks like and smells like. Because this isn't the only community that is dealing with being quote-unquote put out by capitalism off the rails. There's many other communities that have been pushed out of the American dream by this system that is completely off the rails now. And Frances McDormand does such a good job bringing that grounded acting to a very important role. And David Stratum plays her love interest, does a, a complimentary and genius job telling his own story of loss and how he's searching for connection and how he is taking a new opportunity and trying to do something better with it. And that's the macro takeaway that I have of the movie is no matter what your situation is, no matter how much we struggle, no matter how much loss we experience, no matter what it does to us, Fern doesn't let any of that stop her from searching for her happiness, which is just a beautiful ode to America right now. Because I feel like we all have to dig deep and work through our loss. Because it is heartbreaking, but working through our loss is beautiful. And you, that's where the film ends, is Fern is in control. Fern is happy. She may be put out. She may be on the outside of society, quote-unquote. But she's getting to her happiness. And that's what I think is so important about the film. 
is that it teaches us that you can find your own way in this mess of a country right now. You don't have to actually turn everything into um, being a for or against or because I was put out, that means I'm going to make my life an opportunity to get back at the people who put me out. That's not how Fern lives her life. And I think it's a good lesson for all of us because we all have had negative experiences over the past 20 years relative to economics or education or communities or other institutional issues that different parts of the country have experienced. I think that it's a great lesson for all of us. Thanks so much for checking us out this week. You can find more of my work on film-book.com. Just search for Chris Banks or Film Bookcast. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at C. Banksy. I'm also on Instagram. I'm at the Chris Banks. If you listen to this podcast on iTunes or another podcast service, please consider rating and review this episode. If you're listening to this podcast on our YouTube channel, Film Book Podcast, please like our video, subscribe to our channel, and leave us a comment in the comment section. It really helps other people discover our podcast. Please also consider becoming one of our patrons on Patreon at patreon.com slash filmbook. Your support helps us create more engaging content. You'll find our Patreon link below in the description. If you want to tweet about this podcast, just use the hashtag FilmBookCast. Tune in next week for the next episode of the FilmBookCast. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you then.